Hello everyone, uh, I'm Becky Spate, I'm the Chief Executive of the RSPB um, and I just want to say a big welcome to the latest in this our series of webinar podcasts for focusing particularly on, um, on uh, nature-based solutions and some of you may have seen our recent our recent broadcast which was um, all about nature-based solutions coming from our UK reserves, so focused on the UK in particular. So here at the RSPB, we do a combination of science and policy and practice, and I think that makes us pretty unique, actually. Um, and some of you may have seen our carbon mapping work um, that we've done, and some of you may um, indeed have kind of come across us in different guises. But today we're going to focus particularly on the collaborative work we do across different geographies, working with many other organisations to really try and achieve change particularly in the nature-based solutions realm. And we're gonna talk particularly about the UK overseas territories. Now, some of you may be very familiar with these, but there are 14 UK overseas territories in five global regions. So the Caribbean, the Mediterranean, the Atlantic, and the Indian and Pacific Oceans. And these are obviously a really important outreach and showcase opportunity for global Britain, particularly as we run up into hosting uh, the next COP. But um, every major habitat type on earth is covered through these UK overseas territories from peatland to tropical rainforest, tundra, volcanic deserts, uh, coral reefs, ice fields and wetlands. Um, and they hold 94% of unique British wildlife. Uh, they're the fifth largest marine estate in the world and they hold a quarter of the world's penguins and a third of the world's albatrosses. So they're incredibly important. And they're real crucibles of oceanic uh, evolution. Um, so they hold many unique species, but often in very small areas. And that makes them particularly vulnerable to climate change. Now, the environmental responsibilities are devolved to the territories. Um, and we tend to work with very passionate local conservationists. And we've done that for more than 20 years. And we really focus on building capacity, giving them support. And we're really proud of these long term relationships. And you're going to hear from some of those today. So why nature based solutions? Well, these are obviously key for climate change mitigation um, and really um, they're key for the kind of vital adaptation challenges that these communities have because they're really in the front line of climate change. So if you think about things like hurricanes, sea level rise, flooding, drought, these local communi communities are often also much more connected to their local environment in terms of how they live and their dependence on it. Um, so we've got speakers today from across these UK overseas territories and they're going to be showcasing to us new um, and, and very exciting shovel ready nature based solution projects on their islands and talk about some of the unique challenges and opportunities there are in working in these really dynamic landscapes. We're also going to hear from some of my RSPV colleagues um, who will be talking about the kind of work they do as well and really setting the scene of the wider practice of our work um, and the UK's responsibilities towards it as well. So I hope you're going to find it a really informative and a really inspiring session. I know I will. Um, and we'll have an opportunity um, towards the end to ask questions, of course. OK. So first up, we're going to hear from uh, Kettle Warboys, who's going to talk about the restoration of cloud forest on St. Helena. Now, uh, Kettle is the St. Helena Government UK representative. She's speaking to us from the UK and she's the current chair of the UK Overseas Territories Association and the chair of their environmental working group. So she's a great person to kick us off and talk about her case study from St. Helena. Kettle, over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Becky. I'm, of course, very happy to present on our project in St. Lena, which we affectionately refer to as the Cloud Forest Project. But to give it its correct title, it is Restoring the C Cloud Forest of St. Lena, Water Security, Wildlife and Development.
sorry, I've, I've got a technical difficulty in that I can't get the slides to move. Ah, here we are, apologies. So the map shows just the location of all of the territories, but particularly um, St. Helena. So to start then, the location of the cloud forest. You, you will see here that this originally um, covered all high altitude areas above 600 meters. It's now reduced to 120 core fragments on the highest peaks and the slopest steeps and all protected within the Peaks National Park. A lot of this is, is due really to re, um, historic clearances and the spread of invasive plant species. Uh, water security is, is another important aspect of this project. So, the climate impacts on the island is severe. We've had island-wide droughts um, in three years. You can see 2013, 2016, and 2019. The pigs also provide most of the island's water, 60% in fact via mist capture. And two of the nine pigs of the water catchments alone provide upwards to around 40% of the island's uh, water supply. So the cloud forest increases mist capture and ensures slower and steadier water release. This really is, is quite vital. As you can see, as a result of the, uh, the drought, the climate change predictions, um, unfortunately, is for more severe droughts in the future and a 50% increase on consecutive dry days. So not a good picture. Most of our fresh water comes from the peaks. And we have had two recent Darwin Plus funded projects to look at two of the peaks water catchments. And this showed that they actually provide 40% of the island's fresh water themselves. Cloud forest vegetation, of course, also captures more water and the richer peaty subsoil, which develops underneath it, is also much better at holding back water. So releasing it um, steadily over a long period of time and thereby helping to even out the, water, the island's water supplies. Invasive plant species uh, are the worst, as I think most of you will know, at capturing mist and retaining the water on the island. So biodiversity, this is the single most important wildlife site anywhere on British soil. The entire population of at least 250 unique species and one sixth of all unique British wildlife. So incredibly significant. For an example, we've got the black cabbage tree, which is in fact a giant daisy, and the spiky yellow woodlouse, which glow in the dark under UV light. Both of these are on the IUCN red list of species threatened with extinction. And many of the cloud forest species have still not had their conservation status assessed. So there could be many more on the brink of extinction given how much of the uh, habitat has been fragmented. So we come to the plan. So the new pigs management plan was published in August 2019, as you can see. There was an initial all round stakeholder workshop in December 2018. There were three rounds of formal consultation by the St. Lena government. 
and the plan's been approved by our Environment and Natural Resources Committee. Uh, there was a three-day workshop that was actually held on the island in 2018 and delivery would secure the habitat for a sixth of the UK's unique biodiversity and increase the water supply on the island by up to a third. And here I'd just like to really reiterate that this is a project that is very much owned by the island. We've then got the three primary pillars, which, which are water security, biodiversity, and also the socioeconomic development. So water security, you will see here, we've got water capture increases by um, expanding the cloud forest area. Revegetate Diana's Peak Ridge from the highest mist interception to create a new cloud forest habitat and diversify existing habitat for mist capture and peak soil production. With the potential provision of an additional 33% of tr treated water throughout mist ca uh, capture when the cloud forest is mature and the detailed ecological and hydrological research to underpin and inform restoration efforts. So biodiversity is one of the key uh, pillars. So you will see there's 120 existing cloud forest fragments established radical restoration from each each area connecting corridors between the frag fragments created plant output from the native species nursery doubled every year and research and data gathering to inform and maximize the effect of restoration So then we come to the second pillar, which, which is social economics, which you can see is to provide for the structure, the appropriate structure to enhance the visitor experience for locals and tourists, improved access, new focal points, new interpretation, and new safeguards for environmental impacts, etc. Also promotion, engagement, education, and upskilling public comms, community planting events, schools outreach, volunteering, and training opportunities. So the cloud forest is a major cultural uh, significance to all of the islanders. And, and from the peaks, you will have some of the most spectacular views of the island. Tourism is also um, a key focal sector for growth on the island. And the cloud forest has the potential to be much more than a tourism asset. We can target tourists, for example, who's, who are likely to be interested in walking and also um, eco-tourists, the number of which um, is, is of course growing. So the implementation plan so a, a detailed implementation plan is now needed to deliver the management plan. The core group of partners have been working together to develop the project. And this shows uh, excellent public-private cooperation. So you can see from the slide that we've got uh, St. Helena Government's Environmental Management Division, Connect St. Helena, um, the island's utility company, the St. Helena Research Institute, St. Helena National Trust, St. Helena Tourism, St. Helena Education uh, Directorate, and of course, RSPB. So representatives have been meeting fortnightly since uh, December 2019 
for detailed planning and budgeting. So next steps. You'll see that the implement implementation plan was approved by um, SHG in July 2020. This project is now shovel ready. It requires 2.4 million over three years, so 2021 to 2024. There is currently no existing UK government source for territories to submit large scale environmental project uh, proposals, but it is actually essential that large scale nature based solutions can be supported via a new uplift in HMG funding for environmental projects. This project, I would say, ties into the key themes of COP26. So the photo um, that you see on the screen shows um, our Environment and Natural Resources Committee and the project development team after um, ENRC approval of the implementation plan. So around 10 million pound was announced in the March budget and this really must support large scale nature-based solution projects in both the ODA and non-ODA eligible territories, as well as small scale projects led by local organizations. Nature-based solutions are expensive, but if they are, if they are to have um, transformational impact, we really must invest in them. The local ownership is also important to ensure the long-term sustainability of the project. And as I, I've mentioned before, ties perfectly into the UK government's focus for uh, COP26. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kettle. Um, that was absolutely uh, fascinating. And I think it's such a great case study for how the kind of the biodiversity impacts, you know, to deal with the ecological crisis and the, the kind of um, the, 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 the nature based solution to climate change and the socioeconomic benefits all are layered over as benefits from that kind of investment. And that was just kind of fascinating. It looks an absolutely beautiful environment as well. Thank you so much. Um, just a quick reminder to people, we are recording um, this whole um, webcast, so uh, if you want to kind of have access to it later on, we'll be able to give that to you. Um, and also just a reminder that we'll be having Q&As after we've heard from our, our three case studies. So um, if you've got a Q&A, there should be a box that you can put your question in as we go, and we'll be able to kind of just uh, accumulate those and make sure that we answer as many as possible um, when we get to the end of the case studies. So uh, next up, we're going across to Anguilla uh, and we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Louise Soans, who's going to be uh, speaking on behalf of herself and um, Faram Kida, who is um, uh, part of the National Trust for Anguilla. And they're going to be, Louise is going to be talking about their work to increase the resilience of Anguilla's coastlines and wetlands in order to um, address some of the challenges of climate change. Um, now, Farah is actually the executive director of the Anguilla National Trust. She's been there since 2009 um, and she heads up a small but perfectly formed and very impactful team of eight, eight people. Um, and uh, they work particularly um, around the island's natural and cultural heritage um, and do active management and restoration um, as part of that. Uh, Dr. Soans uh, spits her time between the University of Roehampton um, and the Anguilla National Trust. She's been there since 2012 and during that time she's worked on seabird and turtle tracking, uh, endangered species research and also coastal restoration. So this should be fascinating and I'm going to hand over now to Louise. Um, hello everybody, can you hear me? Hello. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah, so as 
I was introduced, we're here, to talk, we're here in Anguilla, and we just want to introduce two of the projects we're currently working on. Okay, so, sorry. So for those of you who don't know anything about Anguilla, it's one of five UK overseas territories located in the Caribbean. And we're, we're located in the, the, we're the most northerly island of the Lesser Antilles. We've got a population of about 12,000 people and an area of about 91 kilometers square. Um, so Anguilla is also, is a very low lying island. It's extremely vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Um, such as in the increasing severity of storms, sea level rise, and this is because it's got a, a very low elevation. It's located in the Atlantic hurricane belt, and its main industry is tourism. So we're very vulnerable to the, the whims of tourists. And this has been um, highlighted over recent, in recent years from um, Hurricane Irma in 2017, which is a Category 5 hurricane, one of the strongest we've ever seen in the Atlantic, that caused billions of pounds of billions of dollars damage across the region, including Anguilla and Hurricane Louis in 1999, which caused more than 217 million pounds worth of damage to Anguilla and caused really severe flooding. The cost of rebuilding following these events um, is huge, um, not just to the UK, not just to the Anguilla government, but also the UK government, which um, which actually had to provide 66 million pounds worth, dollars worth of support to Anguilla following Irma to help with the rebuilding of schools, the clinic, the hospital, and the ferry port. So we want to introduce two of the projects that we're currently working on that um, focus on building the resiliency of Anguilla. The first is led by, both are funded by UK Darwin Plus. The first is led by Anguilla's Department of Disaster Management and focuses on improving the coastal ecosystem resiliency for Anguilla. And the second led by the RSPB has more of a focus on wetlands, but restoring wetlands to help benefit the island. So both projects aim to increase the resiliency of Anguilla's coastline, coastlines and wetlands to climate change, but we recognize quite early on, we need to be able to prioritize our sites. The, there's a lot of work to be done in Anguilla and all the islands. We can't do everything at one time. So we adopted a science-based approach to, to um, prioritizing the sites for restoration. And we did this by working with UK-based environment systems. These are a consultancy who've worked quite a lot in the UK overseas territories. And they were able to help us produce, um, using satellite imagery to produce flood risk maps, opportunity maps, and vulnerability maps. And I'm gonna talk more about those now. So the first stage is to produce flood risk maps. And these are maps that um, model the risk of flooding from storm surges um, to the coastline of Anguilla. So from this map, you can see area, any areas in shades of pink are at risk from flooding when a big storm surge comes, a big hurricane or storm happens. So you see the southern coastline is most at risk, particularly the eastern, southeastern end of the island. But also there is some risk of flooding um, on the northern coastline. This is more due to what we call ground seas here, which are caused by extra tropical storms. So storms that are happening somewhere in the Atlantic, not, the, not around the Caribbean, but they can have really big effects on the, on the sea level and cause flooding that way. So after we've created flood risk maps, maps the next stage is to create opportunity maps. Now these are created, the models include um, the ecological requirements of different coastal habitats, so we can predict where restoration activities could take place. So this map here in green shows areas where red mangroves can be, could potentially grow around Anguilla's coastline based on this model included the sea depth, the elevation, um, the proximity to, to natural wetlands, already existing wetlands and um, ponds, and also where mangroves were already growing so we could get some probables for recruitment. So once we had the opportunity maps and the flood risk maps, the, the models combined these, these, those first two um, maps to create vulnerability maps. Now these are maps that show how flood risk can be reduced if all opportunity areas are restored. So this map here shows area, any area shaded in red would receive some protection from flooding if red mangroves were restored in all of the potentially suitable areas for red mangroves on Anguilla. So you can see that the, 
the reduction in flood risk could be quite significant if we did just restore mang this is just restoring red mangroves. We find these maps help um, people in the local communities, government agencies to visualize the effect that restoration activities may have and it makes them more um, likely to support restoration activities on their property or on their land or around the coastline. So as an example, we've got, well, this is one of our sites, our restoration sites, this is Cove Bay. It's one of the last semi-intact sand dunes on Anguilla. Um, the pond behind the dune is recognized as an important bird and biodiversity area, and it has been pro proposed as a protected site. So the first stage was to create flood risk maps, maps for the area. So again, any shade, anything shaded in pink, areas that could be that um, flood during a storm surge. The blue area here is a big pond, the, the IBA. Um, so of note here is um, this end of the, the bay is a, a, one of the biggest um, hotel resorts on the island and also this end. So these big hotels are significant employers on the island. They bring in a lot of tourists, which brings in money to the island. So the next stage is to create opportunity maps. Where, can we, where, can, where and what can we restore around this site? So in red, these are areas that are suitable for red mangrove restoration. In yellow, areas that sand juice could be restored. And in green, areas where buttonwoods trees could be planted. So there's quite a lot of opportunity at this site for restoration activities. But what we want to know next is what effect will, it, will restoring all these areas have on reducing flood risk. So the next step was to produce vulnerability maps. So the first map here, you can see in green, if we restored all the red mangroves, if we restored red mangroves along the coastline, any areas shaded in pink would receive some protection from flooding. And that includes the two major hotel resorts here, and also countless homes and roads and infrastructure behind the pond, and even quite far inland, really. And on this map, this shows the effect of um, rebuilding the sand dunes, rest restoring the sand dunes again, this actually restoring the sand juice has an even greater impact on reducing flood risk shown by the deeper red color. So we estimate that the cost of restoring this site, replanting mangroves, restoring the dunes, would cost about £100,000. But in the long term, this is a relatively small amount considering the potential damage that storm surges have on this and the, the loss of economy of the closure of two hotels. For example, following Hurricane Irma, both resorts did shut down for about eight months, so hundreds of people were unemployed. No tourists were coming to the islands, they didn't have anywhere to stay. So we think that £100,000 sounds quite, like quite a lot, but actually, relatively, it's not, considering the kind of benefits that just doing these simple restoration activities could have. Next, we have a, an inland example. This is the East End Pond. It floods heavily during rain or extent, um, extended periods of rain. And this picture on the right shows flooding caused by Hurricane Lewis, where seven inches of rainfall fell. So it's not really that much rainfall, but this pond has a very large watershed. So it collected water from a much wider area. Um, also, we found um, a previous study found that the natural, the natural, um, the natural drainage channels of the pond have been blocked by sediment, which is another reason why it floods so easily. So again, we've been working with, as part of the RSPB um, Darwin Plus project, we've been working with environment systems again to model flood risk. So we've been able to model the effect of different amounts of rainfall on flooding around the pond. So the pond here in blue, with five inches of rainfall, the extent of flooding is the red, the red line, 10 inches, the blue line, and with 25 inches, it's quite a significant area, the green area. This is due to the um, elevation and slope of the surrounding area. So again, we think this kind of map can help the local community visualize what would happen in these, these storm events so that we can get more support for restoration activities. And again, we've, we've modeled the opportunity areas around the East End Pond, so the pond in blue, any areas in red where, where red mangroves could be restored, any areas in green where buttonwood could be restored. And you can see the number of homes in gray and roads around the pond. So there is, there is quite a lot of infrastructure close to the pond. So a lot of people are affected by flooding from this pond. So we, this is why we're really focusing on this site. But there's a lot of areas here for there's a lot of opportunity here for restoration activity, which could help to reduce flooding. 
So the next step here um, is restoration. So we have highlighted um, six sites for restoration activity across Anguilla as part of our two Darwin Plus projects. So we'll be doing um, lots of restoration work over the next few years. We've established a nursery at the Department of Agriculture. We're going red, black, white, mangroves, buttermoods, sea grapes, lots of other coastal vegetation, sand dune species. And we're, we've already organized a few um, community group and youth activities for, to do some replanting. These, these two pictures here at the East End Pond where we've already started red mangrove replanting. So um, that's our plan for the ne next couple of years, restoring these priority sites. And hopefully in, in a few years time, we'll be able to show you some nicely, nice, healthy coastal ecosystems, wetlands that are actually providing benefit to local communities by reducing flooding. And that's all, that's a quick summary of our work. Thanks, Louise, that was, uh, that was brilliant. And I, I, um, I particularly um, really enjoyed the, um, the sense of kind of all that mapping going on and the way in which that could be a really great engagement tool with the community, but also the way in which you could map kind of vulnerability, but then also map opportunity and kind of place the two together and see where you could prioritize your work. I thought that was really powerful. And I have to say that I think £100,000 sounds like an absolute bargain <laughs> in terms of what needs to, what needs to happen um, uh, next. So uh, really, really interesting case study. Um, OK, uh, I'm going to bring us on to our final case study. But just before I do that, um, just, to remind, just a reminder that um, uh, we're recording the whole session. So you'll be able to see all of this again if you want to. Um, and also a reminder that if you've got any questions, just post them now and we can kind of build those up. Um, through the final case study as well. So our, our final case study is uh, Lyndon, uh, Lyndon John, who is actually in St Lucia. So he's going to be talking about work on the island of St Lucia. Um, he has a career that's 30 years of being a conservation biologist and a forester as well. Um, he joined us, he joined the RSPB in 2013. And since 2016, he's been our uh, UK Overseas Territories Officer for the Caribbean. Um, so uh, we're delighted that he was able to kind of join us today and talk about his work. Um, he's going to be um, uh, supported in the presentation by two other RSPB colleagues, uh, Charlie Butt and Jonathan Hall, who are also here on the webinar. Um, and, uh, and they will also be available in the Q&A at the end as well. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Lyndon now for our final case study. Hello everyone, apologies for this. Um, welcome everyone to this uh, presentation on NBS, Nature-Based Solutions, as part of a climate change um, response strategy for the Caribbean UK Overseas Territories. What is NBS? We've so far heard in the previous presentations um, work being done and basically nature-based solutions are actions to protect, manage and restore natural and modified ecosystems to address the challenges um, that confront human society and also to preserve um, biodiversity benefits. Here we have the UK Overseas Territories of the Caribbean located between North and South America. And here we have the um, projected impacts for the Caribbean on climate change as um, noted by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, surface temperatures are expected to increase um, and we're fighting to have this kept below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Precipitation is projected to decrease by about 5% and even more and that would um, exacerbate the threat in terms of both food and water um, insecurity. Um, sea level rise projections are expected to be over half a meter. And as you, it was pointed out in the case of Anguilla, um, hurricanes are expected to increase in severity and there may be debates about 
um, anticipated frequency. But even now, as we look at the Atlantic hurricane season in 2020, we now have three hurricanes out there and one tropical storm. So um, that remains a, a, a concern for us. Ocean acidification is expected to continue um, as carbon dioxide is absorbed by the oceans and that presents a threat to our coral reefs. So climate change constitutes an existential threat to the Caribbean island nations, um, but it's not the only um, threat that we face. We have, we are exposed to all the global shocks in terms of financial shifts, um, the pandemic, etc. So climate change adds another level of burden on small island developing states. This is a slide presenting um, the 2017 hurricane season and the sort of impacts that Hurricane Irma in particular had on the UK overseas territories during that year. In the case of the British Virgin Islands, as you see in this slide, um, it was devastating in its impact and it costs you know, 3.6 billion US dollars um, and the UK government had to step in, of course, and provide support. But we also had islanders um, basically taking refuge in um, North America, in the UK, and in neighboring, neighboring islands. So they joined a stream of um, global climate refugees, as it were. But um, hurricanes cannot only deliver um, intense um, powerful winds, uh, as in the case of Irma, which was a category five, but you can also get um, unprecedented amounts of rainfall, as in the case of St. Lucia during Hurricane Tomas um, in 2010. It scarred the island with um, landslides all over. This was 24 inches of rainfall inside 24 hours. The buildings that you see are actually two-story buildings and um, there were fatalities resulting from the landslides. You may note also that the trees still have their leaves on, so it's more than just about winds. So what we have here is um, contingent liabilities um, arising from climate change that are significant to the UK government, um, and that the UK government carries this responsibility for the overseas territories. It has a duty to manage these. And climate change elevates the financial liabilities. And therefore, there's an urgent and pressing need for better spatial planning, as you saw in the case of um, the map work being done in Anguilla. Um, and there's an opportunity for greater overseas territories and UK government collaboration in this regard to develop climate smart spatial physical development plans that um, incorporate nature-based solution strategies. In, the, in terms of a response to the 2017 hurricanes, the UK government was on board and um, has helped to enhance the, the response, the emergency response of these islands. And we had 72 million pounds committed by HMG to support the territories in this regard. Role of nature-based solutions in sustainable development of small island developing states. There are basically three types of NBS approaches and um, type one calls for better protection and use of protected or natural ecosystems that already exist and are intact. You secure, you secure them so that they can continue to deliver ecosystem-based services, whether it's water, or any other resource that's of importance to society. Um, type two, you have the um, sustainability, multifunctionality of the managed ecosystems. And in type three, we're looking at design and management of relatively new ecosystems, such as urban greening projects and um, managing standing um, existing ecosystems. But NBS cannot happen in isolation. It needs a supportive framework, and that has to do with largely policy. So um, when you have policies or a proposed investments and development plans, we need them to be 
um, happening in a policy supportive framework for NBS and that the, the proposed plans are climate and biodiversity positive. And efforts should be made to legally protect primary um, intact and natural ecosystems. Some of the projects that were outlined before um, in the previous presentations come under ecosystem management and social. You saw in the case of Anguilla, everyone has to be involved. You have sustainable agriculture, invest in sustainable tourism, and um, engagement in um, civil society, government, and everyone in the communities. We believe that also physical development planning has a major role and there's an opportunity at the moment um, where some of the islands are in the process of reviewing their physical development plans. And so there's a chance to ensure inclusion of NBS measures and strategies. It could be coastal reef um, protection, marine protection areas, um, inclusion of coastal setbacks in um, allowing for developments. And they would take the format, as mentioned previously, protection of intact habitats, ensuring projects that would take into consideration what we call, call the ridge to reef approach. Basically from your inland regions to your near shore reefs, you take steps such as restoring um, stream banks, um, reducing erosion, preventing as much as possible landslides and coastal impacts and measures such as wet, wetlands restoration and dune stabilization as um, proposed in um, the Anguilla presentation. So in terms of next steps, we have the recently announced uplift in territory funding from the UK government, which should enable large scale um, NBS projects. It's to the tune of one to three million pounds. And we believe it presents an opportunity for closer collaboration between UK government and the um, governments of the OTs, um, which should have this partnership and be able to present the, the work being done with the Caribbean territories in time for COP26 as flagships of resilience in the region. I thank you very much. Thanks so much, Lyndon. That was a great overview of um, and pulled together a lot of the themes that we'd had from the previous case studies. So that was really helpful. Thank you. Um, and I was also really struck by um, your emphasis on kind of spatial planning and just how important that is and, and this kind of need for investment upfront in order to kind of, you know, um, do away with some of those huge costs that we see when these these really kind of cataclysmic um, climate driven events hit these communities. So that was kind of really, really interesting. Um, and I loved your whole kind of um, ridge to reef approach. That's a that's a great phrase. And I can feel myself needing to use that in many ways. But that was great. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I, I know that people will have been asking questions as we go, and there are probably more coming in now on the back of that presentation. Um, what I'm going to do now is just ask um, all of our speakers if they can just um, unmute themselves and um, switch their cameras back on so that we can see everyone. And then we will um, take some of the questions, which I'm really hopeful um, my colleague um, Jonathan Hall has been kind of looking at and is going to kind of uh, group where that makes sense. Um, and kick us off with our first question. Um, so if we just take a second, yeah, I think everybody's back up on screen. Uh, I'm just lacking Louise, I'm sure she's on her way. Um, right, Jonathan, would you like to kick us off with the first question, please? Certainly, first is a pair of questions for um, Anguilla. Um, in particular, thank you very much for your presentation. How receptive have hotels or businesses been to your restoration projects and are they contributing financially? Um, and are there any restoration techniques you've found particularly successful for red mangroves? Okay, that's in two parts then, Louise and Farah. It's kind of the hotel question and then the kind of, and then onto the red mangroves in particular. Do you want me to take the first part? Yeah, I'll take the first part. <laughs> Um, so in terms of uh, how receptive hotels and, and property owners have been, our initial sites that we've chosen 
um, actually line beaches and wetlands where it's primarily landowners rather than hotels. So we haven't gotten to the point where we will be restoring um, coastlines bordering tourism properties. Um, what we're hoping is that we can show the benefits and, and then once we have those results, we can use it to pitch restoration in front of tourism development. Yeah, I can park. Um, yeah, we have, there's quite a lot of um, protocol in the region for growing red mangroves, well, all the species of mangroves. So we're, and they're relatively easy to grow actually. We've just got them here in buckets of salt water. Um, but there are other techniques that have been tried in the BVI where they they put them in um, PVC buckets and actually float them in a wetland. So they, they get the constant flushing of water. But it's, yeah, there's, it, we can grow them quite well actually. We just have to collect enough propagules so that we have enough to replant. We need, we need thousands of them. We need thousands of seedlings. So that's our, that's our challenge, just going out and trying to find the seedlings, the propagules. Yeah, so the challenge, the challenge is volume, not the actual kind of method of, of growing mm -hmm. them on. Yeah, really interesting. Okay, thank you. And I was really interested to hear that you, you're, kind of, you're building up your case study, basically, in order to kind of get those hotels and that, that kind of tourism industry on board. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan, what else have we got? Um, what are the prospects for persuading UK government to give larger nature-based solutions funding, either through the expanded Darwin Plus or new funding sources? Okay, thank you. Uh, does anybody want to come in on that one? Kettle or Linden? So, so we've been lobbying, and, and I'll have to say jointly with um, RSPB on this one, with, with the UK government. Um, and I think particularly as the UK overseas territories have actually lost out being able to access the EU life programme as a result of Brexit. So the UK government has made the commitment for um, this £10 million. It's um, an, a significant increase in, in the funding we had previously. So we will continue to lobby to make sure that um, from the Darwin Initiative, you know, there will be the facility and, and they will be able to continue with the opportunity to um, apply for funding for the, these bigger transformational projects. So the lobbying will continue. I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. Thank you. Does anyone, does anyone want to give a view from the RSPB? Uh, Jonathan, I wondered if you wanted to give a view at all. Um, so we have been yeah, working um, hard on this with all our partners in the territories to show um, both the needs and um, opportunities um, for impact. So the, the increase in the March budget um, of 10 million per annum for Darwin Plus is extremely welcome. Um, it is uh, non-ODA money, so that does leave some question marks for making sure that those ODA eligible territories um, are also able to um, access the support needed and um, all eyes are on the comprehensive spending review and making sure that the, the programming for this new money um, really fulfills um, Kettle's point and both supports large scale nature-based solutions, um, but also enables um, you know, the smaller scale projects led by um, you know, local organizations, which, which provides that, that vital grassroots work, which is the counterbalance to these large scale uh, nature-based solutions. Thank you. Sorry, I'm getting to wear you, getting you to wear two hats there. <laughs> Do you want to move on to back to your back to your your primary questioner hat and uh, mm. ask us another um, question? Greetings from Montserrat. It's good <laughs> to hear what is happening in the overseas territories. Can you share with us some of the issues and challenges you have encountered, and in particular, how you are able to progress? Okay. Who wants to come in on that one? Lyndon, do you want to have a go at that one? Um, I, I think yeah, with Montserrat. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I would, I would probably put it to um, Louise and, and and Guido because they're actually executing just in case um, they have particular challenges that they they're experiencing that they could relate to to Montserrat. However, I will say that um, there is the likely challenge of our OT governments 
not really having or, or fully appre in fact i would say even for the region not necessarily fully appreciating the potential for nba oh we've lost linden i think and oh, so back. we have so we oh okay um so we do have a, a potential for um, we need to showcase effective NBS approaches to the Caribbean governments. I think that's that's one. Yeah. So demonstrating efficacy and kind of building building that kind of that sense of really strong case studies uh, feels fundamental. Um, Louise, do you or Farah want to come in from Anguilla on that one? <laughs> Sorry, could you repeat that, please? So that was it. Was a question that came from Montserrat saying, kind of, yes, fantastic, you know, but what, what, how, what are the issues you're facing, and how are you, how are you really working to overcome them? And Lyndon's just talked us through kind of um, the need to build up really strong case studies in order to kind of build, build the rationale for investment, um, and just whether you had anything you wanted to share from the uh, Anguilla perspective. <sighs> That's, that's a tough one because I think even, even if you look at what happened in 2017 with Hurricane Irma and how much destruction there was and how much everyone was saying, you know, we need to be building back better. We need to be looking at um, these nature-based type solutions. But when it comes down to it and when you're actually doing the work, they forget it and they go back to what they're used to. Um, so it's almost like we're just, we're not learning as much as we're saying that, you know, we're going to use these experiences and, and, and do different. It's just, it's not happening. And at the end of the day, it's because when people are out of work and the construction industry can bring in however many millions in terms of both development, but also in terms of of protection, so building those breakwaters or building those seawalls, that brings immediate funding into the country. And we're just not engineered to look long-term. So I, I don't know what the solution is. We just continue to do our do our do and see how much difference we can make and try to convince people that there are easier ways and better ways, but I kind of I feel like with these nature-based solutions, it's not immediate. You have to wait. Um, and because of that, people aren't seeing what the impacts can be. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, to be honest. <laughs> Well, it's it's the great conundrum, isn't it, really? And I, I think um, I what I did think when I looked at your kind of mapping technique that that was a great way of trying to demonstrate exactly what you were talking about. Um, uh, but uh, you're right. I mean, I think the challenge is always to get get those um, who are leading us or in power to kind of face into those long term um, disbenefits and indeed benefits of addressing it through nature based solutions. And indeed that that can be very cost effective at the end of the day. But um, yeah, it's, it's a big challenge. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, back to you. So we've got a pair of questions from Barry Gardner. The first one um, is the 10 million per annum just for the Caribbean overseas territories. And if so, what is the annual funding now promised by the UK government for the territories as a whole? Um, and if it is for all of the OCS territories, how much is for the Caribbean? And then what is the projected return on UK funding in terms of economic growth and in avoided disaster relief costs? So um, just on the, the first one, as it was actually a follow up to, to my statement, I will um, just sort of say that the, the 10 million per annum is for all of those um, territories um, which are not um, official development aid eligible is my understanding. So that does include um, some of those in the, um, the Mediterranean South Atlantic, um, for instance. Um, and there are um, other sort of incidental pots of UK government funding, but this is the, the only pot which is sort of really um, open for you know, all um, you know, civil society and governments of a territory to actually um, apply for and, and lead on. 
and the projected return on UK funding in terms of economic growth and avoided disaster relief costs um, is an excellent question and in fact the to my mind is that the big unknown that, that needs that needs answering is um, you know we're just sort of facing up to the increasingly um, you know, scary prospects of um, you know, increasing ever worsening hurricane seasons and, and looking really to try and quantify this and some territories have um, quantified this more than than others but as, as frequently the case of the territories it hasn't been sort of drawn together into one overarching um, you know answer and, and statement as yet as far as I am aware but maybe any of the other panel might like to come in on that one. Does anyone want to come in on that one? Anyone done any work on trying to pull that sort of projected figure together, even on a limited basis? I mean, Farah and Lewis, did you have any projection for Cove Bay, that, that investment of £100,000 that you mentioned? Have you any indicative figures of um, the, the projected savings from that, potentially, or the value of the infrastructure that, that lies in that exposed zone? Um, after Hurricane Irma, we actually tried to do a very sort of rapid ecosystem evaluation or assessment. Um, but there isn't a lot of data out there to make those type of, for us anyways, um, to make those type of assessments. So ours was pretty low for some reason. It was like less than 100,000. But um, I think it was just because of the the way we kind of did that assessment and not necessarily what the true value is but yes if you look at the type of development that is around that area you're looking at you know 100 million for development and then the loss of the loss of um revenue for when those developments are shut down because it is a tour next to Cove Bay is a, a major tourism development. So I think after Hurricane Irma, they, they had been closed for the entire season for an entire year, actually. So you're looking at, you know, tens to about tens of millions of dollars, at least that were lost just in that one year. So coming up with some kind of, um, you know, shared methodology for how we do that kind of assessment and and kind of working out that total figure, which will be huge. Actually, it'll be frighteningly enormous. Um, feels like that would be a really a really good thing to uh, to tackle. Um, okay, we've got time for one more last question, Jonathan. Um, well, this is actually one of the ones that was sent in um, at registration, and I should say that um, all questions that we haven't been able to turn to, we will try and um, get back to in writing to those who've. Um, submitted it. Um, but the last question was that um, overseas, overseas territories governments are eager to um, you know, adopt infrastructure projects to address the needs for jobs and demand for ac economic activity, especially post-COVID. How do we best justify nature-based solution projects to the political leaders of the overseas territories? Okay, so that's a question about how we, how we kind of make the justification really stick. Um, Kettle, I'm going to come to you for a view. Oh, you're on mute, Kettle. Can you just unmute yourself? S sorry, Becky. So I can really only just speak for St. Lena, but I, I can say with 100% conviction that our political leaders in St. Lena are 150% behind this nature-based solution project, the cloud forest that we are um, putting forward. Because we, we see that you've kind of got in, to invest now for the future and something that is long-term and sustainable. So in respect of St. Lena, we, we, we don't have an issue with having our political leaders come on board to support these type of projects. Okay, so it's easy. <laughs> in St. Lena, we are in the fortunate position that our political leaders are very much bought into the project. Yeah. Anyone else want to come in on that quickly? Lyndon, do you want to give a view? Yeah. Sure. I think that um, the, the answer lies in 
convincing the political directorate of the, the long-term gains as Keda has said. And yes, ecosystem services, so your water, securing water, um, and also food insecurity for the region is a challenge. And COVID revealed a lot of those challenges because you had trade lines come down, you had everything just shut down and people started to look within the islands and say, okay, how are we gonna source our food because um, things are not moving as, you know, as trade as readily as before. So water, food, etc., should be um, brought out there as part of the environment picture as well so that the governments understand that we're not talking only about some conservation objective, but we're looking at development for the islands as a whole. And it's just part of the package that NBS will help with food and water conservation and in um, securing us against those external shocks like the pandemic, like hurricanes. So it's better to just have this investment done. I'm buying. I'm buying. That sounds very good. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I've had my two minute warning. I've got to I've got to wrap up. It's been it's been a really um, interesting insight into actually um, for me personally into into some of the issues that um, our, our UCOTs are facing in terms of doing this work. Um, the case studies were really interesting. I thought um, that last piece from Lyndon showing the absolute links between tackling climate change tackling the biodiversity crisis, but the way in which this absolutely works on all those ecosystems which underpin our very existence, you know, and, and we can't have a resilient economy, we can't have a healthy world without actually tackling some of these longer term issues um, through nature-based solutions was just really, really um, inspirational, actually, Lyndon. So thank you for that at the end. Um, just to say um, a huge thank you to everybody who's been listening. Um, we are going to make the recording available. We will answer any questions, as Jonathan said, that we haven't got to today. Um, but just a, a final big thank you um, to everybody who's spoken as a panellist today. Uh, that was fantastic. And thank you to everybody who's been listening. Thank you.